We're ready. ready. Yes, sir. Let's call the special call meeting to order. Thursday, the 8th of December, 2004, right at 6, 6.30 p.m. We have two items on the agenda. The first is the management review chairman's recommendation of the city clerk's performance, followed by the review and approval of the draft of the Southwest Master Plan for the Southwest Neighborhood. Councilwoman Wallman. Yes, Mayor, thank you. We have had several meetings, Sharon and I, um, in the past year regarding her performance. And the last one, I believe, was 90 days ago, approximately yes, 90 days ago. And the mayor had asked me to bring forth a recommendation. It's so hard for me to bring forth a single recommendation. So I ask um, council to give me comments as far as if they've seen any improvement or, or anything that they didn't like about the performance of the clerk. And I received one letter and then um, through Patty. And then I asked Patty to poll council and ask council just a couple of questions. You know, are you satisfied or have you seen a, an, an improvement in, in the clerk's performance? I asked them if they thought that the clerk deserved a raise and I asked them if so, how much of a raise would you recommend? So based on those three questions, <coughs> I had two votes that 0% um, raise would be given. I had um, the other council members voted 3 to 4% raise. Mr. Hodge voted 3 to 5% raise. But I took an average, and, and so we're probably in the 3 to 4% raise, raise with the um, Z two zero notes, votes, excuse me. Um, I wanted to go over Sharon's salary very quickly. She did receive a 3% raise 90 days ago, and then she received a 5% raise, which was an automatic raise. Um, I think that was October, was that October, November? It was effective October 1st, but I received it. It was, uh, came on yet uh, last week. Okay. So right now, with the 3% and the 5% that she received, her salary is $53,426 with a, um, hmm, I don't know why I didn't figure 3%, but with 5%, it would, excuse me, with 4%, it would be 55563 And if somebody has a calculator up here, which I don't have, Marlene, do you have a calculator there? Anybody have a calculator on staff? Don't you, don't you have one in your phone now? In your Blackberry? Okay. <laughs> I, I have one in my palm, but I don't have it with me. Don't recall. Um, so, Mayor, based on those things, and as soon as Kurt gets back with that calculator so I can figure it 3%, based on that, just going by what the council has told me, again, we have two zero percents and... Um, the rest of them, I'm averaging out between 3 and 4 percent. I guess we should, I should just go ahead and take comments before. Linda, do you want? I have a question, mm -hmm. actually. I needed a little clarification. So we're talking, when we did her um, cost of living raise back in October, so now we're entertaining another raise on top of the cost of living plus the 5 percent? The, we granted her a 3 percent raise. Plus back the, the last time and then, and then the five percent came about automatically in the uh, union <coughs> negotiations right. that came about automatically um, so the answer is yes so we're entertaining on top of an eight percent we're, we're entertaining another three to five on top of the eight three to four percent okay based on council's comments okay thank you pardon me this is this is an annual review this is a management review yes the three percent was across the board for everyone. Yes. And because she had ten years, she got the five percent. So I right, really don't correct. consider those. Right. I mean, I understand she did just get that, but we didn't just grant that to her right. because of what she was doing. It was because of her position. Right. And actually, based on the last review, she probably wouldn't have gotten that three percent because the reports were not favorable. But I have to say, I've seen a real improvement in, in Sharon's performance. Her professional. Um, uh, Lism has just, you know, she's dressing more professional. She's, I, I think it, your office is happier. I've talked to people in general around the, around the building. 
you know, and everybody seems to be really, really happy. And Sharon, I think you've made a really valiant effort to um, to change some things. And, and we had some really serious heart to hearts, and yes, and I just flat told you like it was, and and I see a great improvement. So I'm I'm very pleased with that. Well, thank you very much. Let me just do this really quickly. Um, I think, Madam Chair, as you um, calculate, I just wanted to make a comment. The, I think my response to um, Patty to forward to you was to consider um, providing Sharon with what all the other non-union members would get as a result of the negotiations, um, to, to really be fair, <clears throat> and would put on the same footing as all the other um, non-union employees. And whatever comes out of that, uh, whatever came out of the negotiation, I felt would be sufficient. So that was my recommendation. Yes, Mayor, and, and Councilman Porter also recommended that we um, stay within the contract negotiations um, for general employees and the PBA so I'm going to ask for a motion and that would be my motion madam chair I'll second it all in favor Aye. 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 The mayor okay. any opposed one, one opposed okay all right Thank you very much. One more thing. Um, Sharon did ask me <coughs> if, if there was a raise tonight, if it could be uh, retroactive as of October 1st. As all others were retroactive to October the 1st, I think it's appropriate. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. This was a really tough job, I want you to Item two, the review and approval of the draft of the Southwest Master Plan for the Southwest Neighborhood. And, and let me say um, to the Empowerment Trust and uh, to all involved, I read it thoroughly and I tell you it's a first class document. Well done, professionally done, and um, I'm very, very impressed with it. Very, very impressed with it. Um, Councilman Hodge, I think this is your project thank you mr. mayor uh, at this time I'll, I'll just go ahead and refer over to Rick and let Rick introduce uh, the gentlemen that are here at Kimberly Horn and, um, and I think they have a presentation that they're going to give us yes um, good evening uh, just as a reminder though we are sitting as council tonight no one's going to be asking for an approval or disapproval of the plan this is really more of a workshop than it is a, a decision-making meeting because after we have comments from uh, you tonight, uh, we have a meeting scheduled in the neighborhood next Thursday night to go over the draft of the plan with the neighborhood one more time and, and get comments from them. And um, just as there will be some tweaking based on your comments tonight, there will be some tweaking based on neighborhood comments uh, next week. And then in early January, we will be bringing this to both the uh, HERO Board and back to City Council for your approval. So we will but not be asked to approve it tonight, but we are seeking, uh, you're di diligently seeking uh, your input, and we ask you to be, uh, please, very open, and, and if you have any problems or any issues, uh, don't cloud them, just speak them right out so we can try to address them. Uh, with us tonight, we have representatives of both the Empowerment Trust, the Neighborhood Alliance, and Kimley Horn, and I would like to uh, start by turning over to Mr. Andre Wallace, Executive Director of the Empowerment Trust for Miami-Dade County. Andre. Good evening, Council Members. Um, just want to give you a quick um, brief history in terms of why we're actually here, and uh, we definitely thank you for the opportunity of working directly with um, Rick and his staff, as well as being able to bring on board Kim Horn and Associates to work with us. Um, one of the reasons why we undertook the Southwest Neighborhood Master Plan is pretty much dealt with the history of the predominantly African American community in the Southwest neighborhood. And its history pretty much follows the actual history of Homestead itself. Um, 
pretty much the history of Homestead is based around hardworking individuals in this particular area centered around agribusiness at one particular point in time. And those individuals that worked in agribusiness pretty much migrated to Homestead at some particular point in time, many of them being African Americans, and they ended up settling in the southwest neighborhood of Homestead. Um, pretty much through the 30s and 40s and 50s, Homestead grew based upon agribusiness. Um, and then in the 70s and 80s, it continued to be a thriving community centered around pretty much a military base. So it's pretty much um, in a metropolitan area of Miami-Dade County itself, but it was still had a, um, an area that had small town values. Unfortunately, two major disasters took place in the 90s, one being an actual natu um, natural disaster and one being a federal policy shift that kind of hurt your agribusiness. Um, both of those impacts in the 90s had a definite impact upon the municipality of Homestead as a whole. But the good thing about 2000 is basically we began to see a shift in the actual marketplace of real estate and that shift in central day to shift to south and based upon that shift in the market forces and the demand for affordable housing the demand for housing in general has been shifted south and with that demand we certainly <coughs> see market forces taking being able to come into the southwest neighborhood and one of our very, very concerns is based upon the per capita income of the individuals in the Southwest neighborhood, based upon the number of rental housing in the Southwest neighborhood, and it's not true quality rental housing in the neighborhood. We know that that area is prime and ripe for actual development. But would that development take into account the existing heritage of the individuals in the Southwest neighborhood? And would the market force, it would definitely bring about change, but because of their per capita income, could they partake in that change? You will see um, Fred Schwartz with Kim Horn Associates will lay out to you a master plan uh, concept that we've worked together collectively with the neighborhood um, and hopefully hopefully getting more guidance from council tonight. But that, that master plan is consistent with smart growth principles. That's first and foremost. Um, Fred will talk about the land use planning and things of nature that are being, being proposed, but we want you to understand and be fairly confident that we made definite sure that this was a smart growth type of concept. We heard your concerns. <coughs> I guess I call it kind of East Homestead. East Homestead really, really grew. So we have definitely planned a smart growth development for the actual western section of um, Homestead, and particularly the southwest neighborhood of Homestead. As the community has been very receptive and been very active in this master planning process, and we, we certainly hope that um, you appreciate and like the work that we put forward so far. So Fred, I will turn everything over to you, and you will talk to them about the actual technical components of the actual master plan itself. Mr. Hodge. <coughs> As we, as we go through the, the presentation, when you get to the, the cross sections of the roadways, can you can you let's be real specific to, to why those some of those are as narrow as they are? We've, we've had a problem with some of the parking on 4th Street and it looks to be about the same. And the other issue is what would when, when you present, would you explain a little bit what, what triggers the use change? You know there's, there's people in the community now that are in heavy use that in the future are going to be converted to a more mixed residential concept. So there's some concern out there. So in the process, could you point that out to us? And, and if I may, for members of the audience, if you have some questions, uh, please hold them until the presentation has been finished and the council has returned to the dais so that they will be able to um, have their responses to you on the record because they, the microphone can't pick them up with them sitting in the audience. I don't think that microphone is on, sir. Can you pick me up now? Yeah. 
Yes, sir, I can. Thank okay. You. Thank you. And um, as Andre said, I'm <clears throat> very glad to be here. Um, Jeremy Earl is real sorry that he can't be here. This is really a project that he started and has been shepherding. Um, he's with his family tonight. His grandmother died earlier this week, and so he's attending to things that he felt was even more important than being with you here tonight. Um, so the task falls to me and Bruno Carvalho, who's with me. Um, Bruno can help answer questions, and because my computer acted up, he's the button pusher when it's time to change the slides, um, which is now, Bruno. Um, you know the Southwest neighborhood very well. Um, it's an area that certainly can benefit from some good planning, some redevelopment, and has some real opportunities and potentials uh, associated with it. It's close to the existing downtown area on Chrome. It is the site of the future busway that's going to bring uh, bus transit directly into the area. Uh, and there are a number of businesses and residential areas that are uh, thriving and need to be capitalized on. Next. <clears throat> this is the beginning of the end, you might say. The, the project that we've been working on for several months is coming to a close. The documents that you received earlier this week are the first two, the conceptual engineering uh, and the neighborhood plan. The financial analysis is a mix of a market study, um, a survey of funding opportunities, and that will be following in the next week or so. The conceptual engineering plan was the first document that you got and and it covers, it looks at the existing utilities, the capability and capacity of those utilities. Uh, it includes an environmental assessment and lays out the the labyrinth almost of the permitting process that we need to go through as this plan continues. <clears throat> it looks at the sanitary sewer um, needs and those areas where eight inch sanitary mains will be required. Um, not, not expecting you to be able to see from here, but this, this graphic is, is in the report. Uh, and the next one is, is the same idea for the water distribution, those areas where 8-inch lines and 12-inch lines need to be upgraded to accommodate the, uh, the kinds of development that are in the redevelopment plan. The engineering document also includes dozens of uh, street cross-sections. Uh, they that there is one for each of the streets in the neighborhood and they were used predominantly to help with construction cost estimates. Um, with these we could take off units and calculate um, construction costs. Uh, they, many of them include parking dimensions um, and lane width dimensions for various right-of-way scenarios. As a little bit of a background, um, and, and for comparison purposes, the dimensions on Chrome Avenue in the downtown include eight feet of parking width and an 11 foot travel lane. Now Chrome has a lot more traffic on it than most or all of these streets in the Southwest neighborhood will have. And so that overall width probably needs to be wider than some of the other more local streets that we have. Um, Fourth Street now has a five foot asphalt pavement, uh, parking width, a two foot valley gutter of concrete, looks like a ribbon that runs down the street, and a, an 11 foot lane. So I'll call that, we'll add the five and the two to get seven feet of parking and an 11 foot lane. This first cross section is for a 50 foot right of way. It includes an 11 foot lane, the two feet of uh, valley gutter, the ribbon gutter, six feet of 
parking. So um, it's similar to Chrome in that six plus two is eight feet of parking, the same comparable width that's on Chrome. The next one then, uh, and, and I've just chosen a couple of them. This is the second one in your book. <coughs> this is a more um, or a less urban cross section. It does not have curb and gutter. It has a swale in which landscaping could occur and parking could occur either in a paved or the grass part of the swale. Those dimensions are a 10 foot through lane, nine feet of swale, and a six foot sidewalk. Next. Now on some streets we have a 60 foot right of way, so we've got more to play with. Uh, this typical section uh, is number 11 in the book. It has a 10 foot travel lane, two foot valley gutter, and seven feet of actual parking. So again, that would be a parking of nine feet. All these dimensions are variable, and we need to be able to look at the uses and the street um, types and functions um, to determine exactly the dimensions that are applicable for each, each block. Uh, and maybe I'll pause there for a minute if there's a question about this particular subject and how it compares to what we've got or, or what we're proposing. Um, I, I was the one that brought the question up because looking at um, what we see happening on 4th Street right now, if you're not in a, a, a miniature car of some sort, you, you do have uh, a considerable problem. You park in the, in the side area where you're allowed to park. When you get out, you're standing uh, three feet into the road. So that's my concern. Uh, it, it, from the from the perspective that the assumption that everyone's going to drive a Mini Cooper it, it may not be the you know the correct scenario, and and that's that's just my only thing is I want to make sure that in some of the complaints that we see that we're hearing in the construction, the radiuses at, and on the Fourth Street, uh, the turning radiuses on some of the Fourth Street uh, improvements, and the parking on some of the Fourth Street improvements have been. Uh, somewhat of a contentious issue for us because they really don't fit the needs of uh, really what what's what's going on from the size of the vehicles. That's my concern. I'm not suggesting some of these some of these layouts are better at nine feet, but obviously some of them were in a in a 40 foot right of way, and some of them are 50, and some of them yeah. are 70. I understand there's a there's a right of way problem. My concern is that we just don't. I don't want to repeat some of the same things that we see that are being a, are a concern right now in the improvements to 4th Street. The other element that can be juggled here is whether we have parking on one side or both sides. Um, sidewalk width is important. Uh, I would rather, I mean the ideal case would be to have parking on both sides and wide sidewalk and adequate travel lanes. If there's not enough for all of those things, then I think I'd give up a lane of parking before I gave up a sidewalk width. Uh, and, and so that's the kind of thing we need to look at, maybe on a block-by-block -block basis as development occurs. Well, from, from my perspective, I would agree totally. I think it's really kind of a, it's a health and safety issue. And, and to get out of your car with your back to the oncoming traffic and really find yourself two feet into the roadway is not really the best case scenario to, to find yourself in. So uh, just for the record, that's a concern that I have with some of the cross sections. And, and I know it's preliminary and things, this is a plan, but uh, that's, that's my concern. Thank you, sir. Thank you. These are the recommendations uh, in the engineering plan, um, in the engineering document. They have to do with um, the capacity of the systems, um, I and I is infiltration and inflow has to do with um, water seeping into the um, storm drainage system um, and so that would need to be looked at as the areas of the plan develop. We've had a couple meetings about uh, a brownfield designation. 
uh, we believe that that's very important not only because there are some sites that may be contaminated but the overall area being designated as a brownfield opens up the ability for funding uh, and for participation from various agencies to help us with the development plan um, that just designating the area uh, goes a long way to helping us with those areas uh, without really even getting into which specific sites are contaminated the other document is the neighborhood plan and this is the one that I get most excited about because it's different from the way we've done things in the past um, and it's a little bit of a an exercise to change the way we think about things the neighborhood plan is made up of three basic sections but the 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 introduction is about land use and zoning and changing the land use and the zoning to allow us to incorporate the the final three elements there of the neighborhood plan which is the regulating plan the street type plan and the development standards those three elements make up the entire neighborhood plan and except for in the introduction we don't use the words land use or zoning anymore now the next slide is about land use but we're going to get those out of the way and then try not to use those words again this is the existing future land use map in the area this this is the map that is in the the comprehensive plan now and it shows the land uses and there are real crisp boundaries of what goes where and it allocates things to different places based on those colors the purpose of changing the land use to a planned urban neighborhood designation is to encourage compact mixed-use development comprised of both residential and non-residential land uses potentially on the same piece of property so in one sense it gets a little bit messy because you can't separate them anymore residential or non-residential they get mixed together so this is what we are proposing for the future land use plan map changing the entire area to a land use designation called planned urban development and the zoning would also be changed Bruno, to be all one zoning southwest planned unit neighborhood um, pretty boring if you're into looking at colorful maps but it's really the basis of what's to come and that is that the land use and the zoning get filed with Department of Community Affairs in Tallahassee they're passed by ordinance they are fixed and probably won't change but the regulating plan is where all the flexibility is and um, where the local decisions can be made to drive the redevelopment in this area this is the version of the regulating plan that you saw a month or so ago when we had the last workshop and the next slide incorporates a few um, changes that we've made to it the just real quickly the intent of the plan is to have a downtown mixed-use area close to the existing downtown um, homestead and to take advantage of the busway um, to have a downtown mixed-use area around the new transit station which will be on 4th Street from there we keep quite a bit of the industrial the same quite a bit of the single-family residential the same and we have categories for a more traditional um, suburban if you will type uh, commercial uses along US 1 uh, and we have multi-family neighborhoods and a neighborhood mixed use to kind of buffer the the single-family from the downtown mixed use
the regulating plan identifies these um, uses and color codes them as we talked about before. Uh, go ahead to the next one, please. Those uses are listed in this matrix along with the kinds of building types that are allowed. So in the traditional single family neighborhood, only detached single family homes are allowed. Um, in the traditional neighborhood, uh, multifamily neighborhood, then you get some more flexibility to have townhouses, courtyard apartments, condos, uh, and so on through the matrix. The X indicates those uh, uses that would be permitted by right, and the S is those that are permitted on properties that have certain, that have frontages on certain street types, which I think takes us to the next slide. Each of the streets have been typed to correspond to the kind of development that we want to occur on those streets. And so now we've got an interplay between the sub areas shown on the regulating plan and the street types. So treating industrial on a commercial street would be different than industrial on a mixed use street. Uh, this is the neighborhood street plan. Um, the main street uh, along 4th Street uh, around which we want to focus this redevelopment. Mixed use streets make up most of the streets and they are uh, the most flexible the, where you can have uh, different kinds of buildings. US-1 is a street type of its own, and so you, we can do different things on US-1 than we can elsewhere uh, in the area. And the busway, although not a street, has been delineated so that we can include that in our planning efforts and address how buildings ought to relate to that busway. There's also a multi-use corridor that has been added since the last workshop and it attempts to connect park areas um, in a pedestrian and bicycle trail type environment. It also connects to the busway. Go ahead. When we think busway, we think high-speed buses, dedicated pathway for those buses, but also within that right-of-way will be a trail that extends the entire length of the busway. So if you're a bicyclist and want to get some miles, this is going to be the place to go. Um, it'd be a long corridor, not many crossings, uh, and except for an occasional bus on its pathway, um, it, it'll be used by pedestrians, rollerbladers, biker, uh, cyclists. Uh, let's go back to that one for just a minute. This is 4th Street and north is this way. Um, I always tilt my head a little bit when I look at this graphic, but it shows that the bus stations or the transit stations are split. The southbound station is on the north side of 4th Street and the northbound station is on the south side. It's a little bit unusual in the rest of the corridor. Very often they're right across from each other. Um, but I guess for right-of-way reasons, they're split here. And it works fine. I mean, you, you'll be going to one or the other, and through these paths and sidewalks, the pedestrian will be able to get to um, the bus station to take advantage of the busway. Okay. <clears throat> this is actually a plan of the um, paving treatment that will uh, be incorporated into the bus station here on 4th Street in Homestead. All of that was about the neighborhood plan. We talked about land use and zoning, the regulating plan, which is close to but not the same as a land use plan. We talked about the street type plan. Um, now we'll go into the development standards, which are, you, are, are the words that knit these two together. Uh, the development plans talk first of all about 
administration, how this um, code actually gets used. Um, more or less, the, the book that you got will become the code. And when a developer comes in to develop in the Southwest neighborhood, that's the code that he'll get that will dictate how, his, um, how he can develop his project. And so there are several paragraphs about how it gets administered, the general provisions of, of how all that happens. Go ahead, please. Under administration, um, one of the things we want to be sure is that POD, PUDs are not allowed. This is more or less a PUD, the whole thing. It's, it's a plan that has been thoughtfully put together. There's a lot of flexibility in it um, for incentives and for motivating development. And so in that way, we don't feel that PUDs are needed. And um, variances are also very limited. Because there's so much flexibility, we don't think there's going to be a need for variances. Uh, there's a little bit of a discussion about how variances could occur. Uh, it also talks about the approval process. Uh, we're proposing that if a developer comes in with a project that meets the letter of the code in terms of uses, building types, how he addresses the streets, that neither the um, Planning and Zoning Board nor the City Council would have an approval of that project be done on a staff level uh, as long as it met um, every piece of the code. Don't hear any grumbling or sighs about that part, so we'll go ahead. Uh, back to that one for just a minute. Um, it also talks about amendments to the, to the neighborhood plan. We know we don't have everything right for the next 20 years. We're not sure what we're, we're going to need to amend, but there is a way, a mechanism to amend it, and there's a series of definitions. The general provisions talk about non-conforming uses. We have chosen a sub-area type and a color and superimposed it on existing uses, and in many cases, the existing uses don't conform to the code. That's okay. They can stay, um, and they can continue business indefinitely. Um, there are uh, provisions about um, if that business goes out of business or if the building is demolished, um, how it needs to convert and conform with the new code. Uh, there's also language about um, natural disasters and things that would um, destroy or, or, or affect the building. The current version of this has a 12-month period to rebuild the non-conforming use like it was to continue the non-conforming use. That's longer than um, is in your current code to do the same thing. Uh, the general provisions talk about parking lots and how they are screened um, by buildings and by walls. It also talks about how the city and the CRA can on the lots that they own, use them for parking lots. Even though that wouldn't meet the rest of the provisions of the plan, um, this reflects the need or the realization of a need to have centralized parking in the area on parcels owned by the city or the CRA. Okay. Basically, each of the sub-areas will have two pages that will tell almost everything you need to know to develop in those sub areas. Um, it'll have a background of what the sub area is all about and what the intentions are. It will list the permitted uses in the particular sub area. It will in the future not have this black blank box, but it'll have a rooftop plan that will show what the buildings ought to look like, how they ought to address the street, where the parking ought to go, and, and illustrate all of the things that the words are trying to describe. It'll list the building types that are allowed in that area. It'll talk about densities, and it'll talk about 
it'll illustrate where that sub area can be found in the neighborhood along with the street type map. Second page will get into more detail about how uh, the lot size, where the building ought to be placed on the property that is close to the street, um, what the building frontage ought to look like and what the setbacks need to be, uh, the placement of parking, which is what this illustration shows that if this is the street that you're addressing, the buildings go on the street and the parking goes in the back, and other provisions about how to knit all this together into a, uh, a site plan. So those two taken together um, will tell you almost every, everything you need to know depending on what sub area you're in. Um, there are several pages in what we've given you about architecture. Um, they're repeated in each of the sub areas so that you can go to that and understand the kind of architecture that we want there. Um, but what we've heard you say and, and the community say is that basically it's a Bahamian uh, vernacular that will run through the, the theme will run through the neighborhood. And these are just some sketches that are uh, indicative of what's in the code about uh, how that gets translated. Uh, and how parking lots can be handled um, and screened from the side street, how they get handled behind the building on the main street. Um, it's a fairly big landscape section, which I, I didn't address, but uh, we can answer questions about um, and how landscaping incorporates into the plan. Uh, what's next? Um, as Rick said, we have a workshop next week to show this information to the public in a more um, informal, conversational kind of way where they can point to a property and ask specific questions about that. Um, the LUPA is underway, the Land Use Plan Amendment. Uh, we talked about the entire area becoming a new land use. Uh, we are finishing up that probably as we speak they're probably still burning the midnight oil on that this evening and tomorrow uh, that land use plan amendment will be uh, will come before you in the next week or so uh, is that the 15th 20th, 20th. Um, the zoning um, will follow those those are really the foundations to uh, allow the neighborhood plan to come before you as well so those three pieces will enable um, all of this to happen. Um, if we go to the next slide, Bruno, we'll see how all these fit together. Um, the land use plan is along this side, this is the rezoning, and this is the neighborhood plan. And there are various meetings and milestones and submittal dates and review periods that the state and others have, but all of, all of those can come together in a city council public hearing to approve all three of those um, sometime in April. Uh, then it, it actually gets adopted, the land use plan gets adopted at that point, but there is a DCA final review. Um, we'll get a notice of intent to approve it or not. There's an appeal period that can occur. So it's not until sometime in June when all of this can become effective. Based on the decisions here in April though, the rezoning and the neighborhood plan are pretty much done. They just can't happen until there's a land use plan to plug into. So there's a certain amount of certainty that occurs here in April with the final I's dotted and T's crossed in June. Uh, that's, those are all the slides I've got. I'd be glad to go back to any or answer any questions that you might have on, on any of this. I made a comment about not 
much of a need for variances and if they are they would pretty much it sounded like be done administratively with with bypassing the council um, could you can you explain that a little bit better well, I think um, there are a couple things that got mixed maybe in the translation um, if there's a Then it does have to come to various um, boards to get a, the variance approved. If there's no variance, then we're proposing that it could go ahead without uh, P and Z or the council. Does that answer your question? Yes. Question. Yeah. And if we, if it's possible, we could go back to the aerial with the color overlay that has the different designations. It's probably probably easier to make reference to the big one on the wall here <laughs> as long as we've got the screen down before sure. going to the little one that's in the uh, in the book and just some specific comments just at this point because we have the benefit of the big map here if, if we can go back to that is that the first slide okay. so now the, the, this this photo that has the color overlay that has the different designations uh, might have been that yeah, one, there you that go. One. There you one, go. Whatever's one. pending now, and your your more reddish, which is called downtown mixed use, and if you, and in my perspective, looking at the map, the area along Fourth Street between Chrome Avenue and the Busway, and kind of maybe going up to that little short road I guess that would be third up to the north and maybe sixth down to the south not the whole triangular piece but but down in there and and looking at existing conditions and I know you've taken into account you know current non-conforming existing uses it was seen to me that within that corridor we have some long-standing zoning and some master planning that was tweaked perhaps accidentally or without a lot of input about three years ago but there's heavy use there that doesn't to me seem to fall within your definition it falls somewhere between your definition of commercial and your definition of industrial and for example maybe a radiator repair shop and some tradesmen and craftsmen and uh, battery shop maybe even a, a small car repair or oil change for some some you know some small auto servicing something like that that to have these core neighborhoods and if you know in the big picture and the the you know the new urban planning to to diminish the need to drive i'm wondering if that's the appropriate place to not only recognize and respect what's been there for quite some time but to continue to allow those uses that fall somewhere between your currently defined commercial and true heavy industrial so that you don't really have to leave the southwest neighborhood to have that wide array of services and by doing that you know to me the busway is a clear line of demarcation it's a real transition point and chrome avenue being a major corridor and the busway being the divider that you know personally I'd like to take and have us reconsider that designation or at least in that area tweak that definition that would allow not only what's there now to be more conforming but to allow those businesses to to either expand or as one moves out others to come into those existing buildings and provide those what I would call heavy commercial uses that would be ancillary to the neighborhood because I think there's some real Real inconsistency in that couple of block area between Chrome and the uh, and the proposed busway. And, and I, th I think that's a, a fair comment. And one way to do that would be to extend this commercial out out into that area. The way we looked at that area, though, was that yes, the busway is a divider, but it's also a node. It's also it's also can become the center um, 
around the stations can occur pedestrian oriented uses because people getting off the buses are pedestrians at least in, mm -hmm. in the first few steps um, and so we looked at that as the circular area around the node of the bus station and wanted all of that to be walkable um, even if it was an employer uh, that the employees could get off the bus and um, walk to their place of work um, the the rule of thumb for a walkable community is a quarter of a mile now that extends from the bus station extends directly north and south to the boundaries of the neighborhood and really is something like this maybe doesn't quite the quarter mile doesn't quite get up to the established part of the Chrome Avenue downtown but we wanted everything in that quarter mile to be as walkable as possible uh, we see that uh, we could see that Chrome Avenue here would become um, much more pedestrian oriented with the downtown uses on the west side and these commercial uses need to behave like pedestrian oriented uses because they are on this mixed use street and that's a good example of how the street types and the sub areas knit together you can do something in this part of this color that's quite a bit different than what you're allowed to do in in a different part of that same color because of the street it's on but we'll be glad to entertain that that comment I didn't mean to get too far away from your request because yeah, I mean, you know if, if you go there and you look at what's actually there and what's been there and and some of the investment that's been made and the the vacant lots that adjoin <coughs> some of the established you know the heavier uses that that maybe if we're going to have those to have co a, the complete array of services and businesses in a neighborhood that to me would seem to be the place to to allow that it's just something you know it's probably each of us needs to ride down there and you know refresh our memories you know when, when you're here and ride by it sometimes you don't see it I have a, I have a, oh, I have a statement or a question mr. Lozner worked really really hard in our street signage you know getting something that's going to distinguish what homestead really is and I'm hoping because I didn't see it in the book anywhere that we're going to continue that on into this plan because I, I think that's his greatest legacy myself I mean I think it's a wonderful and I'm I love our signage and our and our street lights and and what you know it, it distinguishes us Throughout as being yes and and if we really ever want to make this all one city we have to bring it together and make that happen so I, I don't know you might want to address it because I didn't see it in the book maybe I just didn't see it that's something that test test that's something that's in our, our general code and those lights will be required throughout the city not just other places but that is one of the things where the city codes come into the southwest and as we're redoing streets and redoing the lighting the, the signage and the lighting will all conform with everything else in the whole city well, we didn't I'm glad to hear we that. didn't put into the plan lighting because if we choose to change it at some time in the future we don't want to have to change the plan city code's going to dictate that well, as, I'm, as part of the code i'm very glad to hear that mayor may i may i ask a question or uh, one of the there's been a lot of effort put into this into this uh, process to try to revitalize you know the southwest community and there's uh, a little bit of a groundswell out there that's when you when you talk about overlay and zoning changes of the magnitude that you're talking about today um, I think there's some confusion I think I'm still a little confused about taking some of the uses I think uh, Mr. Lossner uh, was dead on you know some of you've got some of this that's in a, a extremely I mean a bulk plant that's going to go from a, a, a fuel pumping station to a, uh, a a residential neighborhood and and 
you're going to rezone that or apparently rezone that. So we've got to get this message out a little bit differently somehow because I, it, what's going to happen is this, this whole project could be corrupted because of the business owners not understanding what is trying to be done. Because, it, you know, yes, they're going to be able to operate. What kicks them out of business? What allows them to stay in business? You know, because there's confusion. There's very, you know, I read through where a report of it said, you know, if you have $5,000 worth of building permits, then you're mandated to do the landscaping. Was well, there, you know, what's going to trigger the devastation? What is the devastation level that makes someone have to quit operating? You know, so, I mean, I don't need to know tonight, but this is where this thing is heading. And there's been so much effort and so much money and, and so much time, and it really needs to be done. It's almost like we need to go to these businesses where you're going from, you know, a bulk plant doing business for 50 years to converting it and rezoning it to a, a traditional neighborhood. That is a that is a vastly different uh, situation that you're going to, and you know if you read this and you listen to what we're going to do, we're going to rezone it. So, Mr. Manager, you know we've got to be careful here. This thing can go sour very quickly for for the uh, because of the confusion. No one is coming to these meetings. These business people aren't coming to these meetings. These business people are staying home. And then in the process, this, re this heavy rezoning is going to come back somewhere down the road and bite this process. So that's just that's a flag that I see being raised up right now, and I think Mr. Lawsoner probably sees it as well, because there's major, major, major changes being done. And it's not apples to apples. You're not, you're not doing minor changes. You're doing major, major changes. And I know that's what has to happen. But they've got to be able to understand why and be able to buy into the process and to be able to know that they're not going to wake up one morning and be out of business. That's a huge concern right now. I may be the only one that's hearing that. I, I, I don't think so. No, but I think we are. that's my position. Right. I, and we've got to do a better job of whatever it is we want the public to know about this and it's not holding a, a, a meeting at seven o'clock it's almost going to be to the fact that we're going to have to take a look at these neighborhood changes and go down to these people and explain to them what's happening because other people are telling them what's going on and it may not be factual yeah, and this is no easy concept to grasp I mean you know you can read this, but you can't digest it in one reading either. Well, that, that's, you know, we, we have the luxury of having the professionals come and sit with us hours at a time, and, and the book's given to us. Uh, but the business community that's out there that's seeing this, you know, what, what used to be industrial going to a um, traditional neighborhood, and it's going to be rezoned. Uh, that's a huge, that's a scary thing for them. And that's what we've got to do is figure out how to make that work and make those people understand we're not putting them out of business. Otherwise, they're going to be beating this door down at City Hall. This, there's no doubt that this is a very visionary plan. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, there are safeguards built in to protect existing uses and I agree we need to find a way to communicate that maybe one-on-one -on -one is the best uh, because it so. affects different properties differently and so we probably need to talk to property owners about how it affects their property yeah yeah and if, and if I might you know let them sit down and say well what if I want to do this or how do I do that you know give them the clear <laughs> yes no or yes if you do this kind of thing and, on, and on a case by case basis right and and to add there's not it's not going to take a hundred percent of the door to door in, in this process because some of these minor changes are going to be felt very minor but some of these areas along the busway that you're going to go make these major major changes this was a railroad bed this was a heavy industrial use railroad bed that now is going to be ultimately hopefully a metro rail people system people mover but in the in the short term we're looking to, to plan to have the bus that's a total change but the people that are there they're doing the business today are doing business based on the railroad 
uh, the heavy industrial use. And you can take a look, I think, very easily and identify the problem areas that you're going to deal with. And I think that we need to not surprise these people. We need to find a way to go and knock on their door and say, here, we're here to tell you what's going on. Otherwise, they will be back at our door after all this process is over. They'll be very upset. Thank you, Mayor. If I may for a moment. I spoke to Susan Trevartan this afternoon about some of this issue uh, just to make sure I had an absolute clear understanding of what our code uh, said. And she said that as long as someone remains in operation, no matter what use we put where they are now, they will be able to continue to operate and continue to operate and continue to operate and they can sell it, they can pass it on to inheritors, they can give it away and that permissible use goes with them. It does not go away with their change of ownership. The only thing that would prevent someone from continuing the use that's there now would be two things. One, there is some reason that they close down for 90 days or more and discontinue using the facility for what it's being used for. And that would hold true today in any zoning issue where if someone quits using a piece of property uh, in a non-conforming use situation for 90 days, they don't, they lose their grandfather. So if they choose to close it down or if there were some sort of natural disaster that destroyed it beyond the 50% point then they would use, lose their non-conforming uh, use uh, grandfathering. We can, if we choose, create a scenario under that natural disaster where someone could rebuild even in a non-conforming use situation, but that becomes a policy decision for the council to make so that, that those issues can be dealt with for the highly unusual situation. Um, but Susan, you know, confirmed that someone uh, can continue to operate at forever till the end of time, barring those couple of things that would impinge. The question Al also, when we get ready to do the major zoning change, every property owner in the southwest area is going to have to receive a notice of that zoning change. We're, we're going to mail a notice out to everyone because we're changing the zoning on their property. But Rick, that, and that addresses the owner who is the user. Yes. But it doesn't address, and there's examples in that segment where an owner has the heavy commercial light industrial business in one bay of the building he owns and rents out the other side and has tenants come and go and that's the first and foremost problem I'm hearing about that the new tenants can't come down here and get a business license if it's what's going to be a non-conforming use that you know we've you know Susan has addressed the owner user but not the, the tenants who come and go which I, I think still a pretty substantial issue as well yes it is I hadn't thought about, I, I and, didn't even and talk and that's, to Susan about that's that. That's, a, I think, a big bone of contention. You know, in addition, you know, a good example being the bulk plant that's been there in excess of 50 mm -hmm. years, and all of a sudden, well, you got to have traditional neighborhood houses there. Um, so, you know, those are just some of the, the permutations of the scenario that we're going to have to address or, or accommodate, try to accommodate anyway. Rick Sean, you're still here. Can I ask just another quick question? Um, I, I, I'm very uncomfortable with that uh, being shut down for more than, what did you say, 90, 90 days. days when it comes to weather and, and fire or, you know, I just, that, that doesn't settle well with me. So the way, I, the way that we have it in this document before you tonight is that you have 12 months to rebuild a non-conforming use to the way it was. Okay. Uh, and, and we really need some input, some direction from you on that. Is 
is it 90 days like your current plan has or, or well, for example when we had the storm of 92 it was two years sometimes before a business got back up and running you know I mean Absolutely. It, it was just a disaster so um, traveling around the state there's still a lot of blue roofs on houses from three months ago or whatever it was and so it, it, yeah. it does take a very long time and uh, we, as I say we we really need some direction on that we've got a 12-month time period now in this document the way it is um, but that that can be changed. Could you, could you do a 12-month and then with a revisit I mean in other words to review as to why the reasons why it hasn't been back in operation I would foresee in another Andrew or even lesser situation whatever council is sitting there granting variances for people who are unable to rebuild within that 12 month period because of lack of material, lack of workmen, but, but insurance issues. I mean, what you're trying to get at through those restrictions is the normal, not the abnormal. Like our current code has the 90 day discontinuance of use in it, then when you go to put it back to use, you have to bring it all the way up to code. And if you're doing something in a non-conforming use area, then you may not be able to put it back to that use. But that is, the code is written as if that person is choosing to close that down. But Rick, I feel very uncomfortable. I, I mean, the way the city's growing, who knows who's going to be on this council. And it's our job to protect us not only now, but also the future. And, you know, who knows what an agenda a council person may have you know I, I'm being very honest I just I just feel very uncomfortable I, I want to as long as I sit on the council I would rather do something now to protect the people in the future rather than depend on just whatever Joe Smith's going to be setting up here um, representing the people um, there's a there's a there's another side of that too though Judy and I, I think it's to protect us too <clears throat> um, some people will not do anything and have a, 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 a structure to sit there for 96 months a year and do absolutely nothing. Right. But I think the current code says that you have 90 days to rebuild. But if there's hardship, I think there's something that say they have a right to come before council and said, due to these circumstances, I need an extension. And I'm sure we reasonable people we will provide that extension but I tell you the more time you give some people the long it will take and you'll have that ugly structure there sitting there months after months after month without anything being done so I think that the 90 days is appropriate with with some language that there are will be hardship situation of course national disasters that I think any elected official realize it gonna take a while and we can give the, that broad extension to, to, to the community, but the, I think in any, any normal situation, there should be some momentum in rebuilding that structure within a 90 day, 120 day, because if not, it's gonna be an eyesore to you, me, and the community. Uh, Mayor, members of council, just to, uh, the mayor's correct, there is an option in there, if you have a fire or a natural disaster, that council can extend it, but one thing everybody needs to understand about the non-conforming uses, I mean, they are there for a reason. Um, now, the way you get around it is either you don't change the land use. Uh, a lot of this area already has many non-conforming uses in them. They currently are in the current land use designations. But our non-conforming uses, you can sell the property to somebody else as long as they continue the same use and there's not a gap of more than 90 days. The license can be transferred. You cannot expand your business. You could not buy the lot next door and add on items like that. You can't expand. Um, so there, there are plus and minus sides. One of the things that I'm seeing now, um, since we've gone through and disallowed duplexes, and this is just a, an example since we've gone through and disallowed duplexes and, and all the R2 property in the city and R3 properties. As people go to sell, I'm starting to get some of the banks that are 
not responding very well because now they're having to finance a non-conforming use. So we're starting to see some of that take place on those instances. I don't know what it, how it will work out with, with commercial, but, you know, um, Ms. Walman, you, you run a mortgage company. Uh, a lot of these when, when they have to get a zoning letter to say, is it a conforming, you know, is it zoned correctly, that type of thing, and, and all of those that come forward, I would have to issue a letter that, no, it's not. So then they would have to face that battle. So you, you have pluses and minuses. I mean, obviously, you know, in these plans, you have to look long term, 20 years down the road. What do you want to see there? How do you want to have it look like? But there will be hardship on those that are there. It is manageable, as I said. You know, they can continue. Op you know, they can continue operation. Has been said here, um, as long you know, barring more than 50 percent disaster or, or stopping operations. You know, if they go bankrupt, then chances are they're not going to continue anyway. Right. But they can sell the business. They can transfer the license. They just can't cease for more than nine days. But again, they can't expand. And we are facing some of those other problems with, with the financing now that we're starting to see. Just one more quick question. What about the business owner that purchased the lot next door with the hopes of expanding their business but hasn't put anything on that lot yet? I mean, I know several you personally. Do. Well, I, I have some right now that are in the in the buying that have done that and know they, they can't do yeah, it now no, anyway because they're already they're in a situation where they're already There's not conforming. Radio, Exactly. exactly. Yes, and exactly. they're in a non-conforming instance right now, and, and no, they cannot expand, and and they can't do it now. And and, and if this goes through, no, they can't. But it's you know it's council's decision on how you want that to to play out. I mean, do you want to revisit what that designation is in that area? That's the only way to to amend that um, is is amending what that designation is in that area. I think we need to have some additional workshops. You know, just come back to us and tell us what you find when you go down and talk to these people and and you know I, I mean I think it's a good overall plan but I just think there's a lot of tweaking that we have to do because you're gonna have just as Mr. Porter Mr. Lozner said you're gonna have people up in arms I mean I can't even imagine at this point you know as to what some of them are gonna do the, the, the issue of that second lot though Ms. Ms. Wallman is no different than if you or I went into that area today where that lot is now zoned multifamily and wanted to put an industrial site in there? Any answer would be no. It's a multifamily area. It's not industrial. That's the same answer that's given to the guy next door who is industrial, who wants to do industrial on that multifamily lot. No, that's multifamily. And so, I mean, that's not a discrimination against him. It's that same answer to anybody who might own or buy that lot and want to put into that non-conforming use. And, and I think, um, as Charles and Rick have said, if you're looking at the plan and you're looking long term, or what you want that community to look like 20, 30 years from now, you don't want a continuation of that non-conforming use. So any opportunity we have to make them fall in line, I think that's that's the purpose of the plan, the, the, the long-range plan, is to embrace the concept and to create this community, that this vision that we, 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 we see um, that um, they'll put forth this evening. But, but certainly, as my understanding, any existing business will be grandfathered in based on this plan, no impact on them whatsoever. Unless, as was mentioned, the examples with the 90-day or um, bankruptcy or what have you, then we would ask them to conform to the, to the new um, zoning. So um, I just think we didn't, it, it's not what existing today, but what we plan to see 5, 10, 15 years from now in terms of um, the neighborhood, and I think that should be our goal, but not to interrupt what is going on today. The word need to get out that if you own a business in the Southwest community today, you're safe. We're not coming in and and changing your zoning, or or, or deny you the right to operate for now and ever more. We're not we're not closing any businesses. We're not, not at all making anybody stop. We are changing the zoning. We're changing but zoning. We're not changing what they can do 
based on what they're doing right now. Right now, that's good. And it, this is, uh, uh, it, it's tough to have this vision. It's tough to be visionary. <laughs> but we really need to look 20 years in the future. And at the same time, look around you in South Florida and all over Florida at the uses that have changed dramatically from boat yards to um, high-rise residential and from abandoned commercial to mixed use. I mean, it's happening. And we need to look 20 years, but realize that some of this is going to happen soon. Um, and we want to set up the plan and give the incentives so that it can happen soon. We don't want to look too short. We don't want to aim too low. Can I, can I just, I just want to say for the record, my issue is not with the plan. My issue is that any kind of a transition is difficult. And the, the anti-world out there that likes to send out misinformation <coughs> is there. They're out there and they're trying to do the, the submarine act on this, on this process. <coughs> And what we need to do is we just need to make sure that all the business owners realize exactly what the mayor said, that we are not putting people out of business and let them understand and buy into this process. This is a 30-year plan. This isn't a 15-minute plan. And that's, that's my only concern is that we don't wake up one morning and have this whole community misinformed about what this project is and and then not be able to implement it because the mayor has sat here and pounded on the table and mr hodge has pounded on the table to get something going and we're here and all of a sudden there's this little groundswell of 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 confusion so let's fix the confusion that's going on so that we can go on ahead and do the things that we need to do in this community because it's been it's been left alone too long would the council feel more comfortable if the CRA was to take it upon itself to get with uh, Kathy over the next several days and get the name and address of every person who has a business license issued within the Southwest planning area <coughs> and send a letter to each and every one of those businesses advising them that the, uh, the planning that's going on and the fact that their business will be able to continue doing what it is doing that this plan is not going to put somebody out of business uh, by its very adoption. I think I think it's incumbent upon us to do something to that to that effect because in the absence of us doing it, the the others out there that are be that are being missing the misinforming element is out there doing that same thing now. Okay, so we've got to figure out a way whether it's a letter, whether it's maybe the CRA. Uh, group goes down in the in the new CRA car and speaks to someone <coughs> that may be an option as well but I think it's I think it's very I think it's very critical and that, that we don't let this thing get derailed that's that's my opinion Rick I, I, I appreciate whatever you can do letters or anything else and thank, thank you Mr. Hodge thank you and and I and I basically ditto uh, what Mr. Porter is saying, Rick, and I think that would be an excellent idea to to um, implement uh, something of that sort uh, for us. As and, and I think uh, again, what what Mr. Porter and and the mayor has said is is it's not necessarily the the changes that are are being recommended or, imp or to be implemented uh, as a future plan is is not necessarily the issue. But I think it's the misunderstanding of the purpose and the misunderstanding, um, uh, again, the misinformed information that is starting uh, to circulate. And when I addressed the amendment w about the PUN, I took a brief moment not to explain in detail, but just to bring it out there. And that was my purpose of doing that, uh, because that information is, is starting to fl uh, float around. And, and and to my under, you know, to my understanding, the uh, um, non-conforming use um, code is our current non-conforming use code. That's nothing that this particular plan has has changed. Uh, if anything, um, what they're proposing is to actually extend it a little bit further than what our current 
code is and that and allows um, so if anything it, it offers more flexibility and not tying the hand of the the business owners so it, it is it is ideally um, current use friendly uh, but at the same token uh, you know this council being the visionaries that that we have been um, should should uh, em embrace the plan as a, as a future uh, plan and and embrace it as a, as a vision for for down the road. Um, will it happen? Will it con uh, completely happen tomorrow? No, it won't. But you know, 10, 15 years down the road, and our, and our kids may be sitting in our in our seats. Then they will have our plan that we approved to, to look at. And again, uh, this is where it comes to um, a heart check uh, because you know. Over the past over the past year that I've I've been sitting on council, you know the current comment is, you know we make our decision based on based on the future, not based on what is there now. We've made decisions consistently based on what we want to see in the future, not what's there now. And you know from time to time we get off we get off a track from that vision and we look at what's there now. And I think we need to uh, stay consistent with with that that message and stay consistent with that thought and that vision in mind because if, if we ever backtrack to what's, what's there now and you know, I think we're, we're, we're going to be putting our, ourselves in a, in a position where, where you know nothing's going to happen and change must come change must happen and you know it's what we call growing pains and you know and as you grow there will be some pains nothing is going to be perfectly smooth however we can manage that and and, and try and um, soften the blow if you will as much as as much as possible and I think that is the idea um, that that Mr. Porter is, is placing on the table is to talk to some of the business owners and explain um, what is taking place and how it's taking place and whether or not that it whether or not it will put them out of business or not and again I don't think it is to uh, put anybody out of business uh, it is something that is put here for a plan for the future uh, and to to revitalize a community that, that necessarily needs uh, revitalization so again I, I think that we just need to have a you know a hard check and look at this as a vision and and not as you know tomorrow because it was there today it's not going to be gone tomorrow but maybe 15 years down the road it, that's that possibility is there but we do need to deal with that issue for as giving the business owners a, a good opportunity to look at this although we've had many meetings over and over again but you know always at the ninth hour someone comes up and and want to and and put salt in the plan um, but again we we need to explain this to these individuals so they do have a good understanding of, of what is taking place thank you So the, we have some folks that have been down here a long time. Maybe make personal contact with them, you know. Um, um, I think that would be very, very effective. Some of the larger ones and some of the ones that just have a history of doing business in the area, just, just update them on what we're doing. You can't reach them all, but I just think some of the major players and one that have a long-standing history of um, working in the co community and making a contribution I think they should probably get a personal visit from you or somebody on your staff and share with them this vision and 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 I assure you that most of them are going to embrace it I don't think you have a problem with it and we we've, we've done some of that where we have had uh, people express concerns uh, Dan and I even last week wrote up to uh, Miami to visit with George Lopez with Everglades Lumber to, to give him a comfort level. In fact, he, he looked at this and said, you know, there along 3rd Street, I was planning to build a building. I think I'm going to move it further to the interior of my property because on that north side of 3rd Street, from what you're telling me, I may want to build some retail with some housing upstairs. Be a better use of my property than just another metal building there along 3rd uh, Street by the busway. 
I think we will see over time many of the businessmen who right now have hesitation and maybe in a few cases absolute opposition look and see what can be and buy into it and some of them will have to, to to have a visit from someone and some whenever will but some of the area where Mr. Lozner is concerned is very true but whoever owns that radiator building five years from now may say you know I can make more money off my land if this is not a radiator shop but if I come in here and put some downtown downstairs retail and a couple of floors of of housing I can make more money off my land than as a radiator shop or as a automobile repair shop or as this or as that and this allows both things to happen it to stay as it is or become what in many cases is going to become more profitable for the property owner that's good thank you Mayor, any, I appreciate any other your, comments I, I appreciate your comments about the document earlier this evening um, mine has got all kinds of marks in it I'm going through and changing and editing and we would invite you to do the same and over the next uh, couple weeks after the workshop next week we'll make revisions and uh, and reissue that before we come back to you again thank you sir thank you so very much any other comments before we close this um, meeting vice mayor I want to say overall I took a good look at it and I think it's a fabulous plan I was really kind of surprised with the extensive amount of detail so I would just say it was very very good work thank you vice mayor any other comments mr. Lozner miss um, Ms. Garner mr. Hodge thank you all very much thank you. happy holiday to you Before we walk away, any comments from the audience? Um, if not, let me ask all of you, the plan is not done. We have not approved it. There's still room for comments and input. Um, I encourage you to um, contact Rick and his staff and, and, and give them your information. We, we want as much input as we can get before we finalize this plan. So you still have time. To digest what we presented tonight and we, we ask you please to study it and give us your feedback we look forward to it any comments from the audience any comments from the audience if not thank you all very much <laughs>